We are going to move to the pose called Supta Pada Gustasana, um, which Supta means recline, Pada is the foot. Um, so it's reclined, um, reclined holding the foot up pose would be one translation of it. Um, I've got a blanket under Emily's head, and often in class um, people ask me why do I insist on that, but let me just show, I'm going to have Emily um, pretend that she has tight shoulders and so that when she's on the ground her chin is very lifted. So if you're working, um, I see this more with men than women, but um, if, you have a, if you're working with somebody with a really tight upper back, um, they, their chin is lifted towards the ceiling and basically you want the chin to be about level with the breastbone. Okay, so I would say most people need a blanket under their head. And then earlier I talked about the, the rib poking issue, so that can also help if you're working with somebody who has a tighter psoas. So, and then you're gonna see also um, that blanket is super helpful with the next pose that we're gonna do because if she doesn't have something under her head and I want her to release her pelvis into neutral position, she's not going to be able to do that if she doesn't have support under her head. So I want you to think of the base of the skull and the sacrum, the two ends of the spine, they tend to mimic each other. So if her chin is up in the air like we just showed, then her tailbone also is going to be more tucked. If I can get the base of her skull to be more level, then her sacrum is going to be more level. Okay, so I would say 95% of most people need a blanket under their head. Okay, Supta Padagustasana, you need a belt, and she's going to take the right leg up first. I'm going to show you some things that can go wrong here. Okay, so as we determine, Emily has a little more open body, so she could, if she wanted to be aggressive, she could pu pull her leg past 90 degrees. And... Uh, you may want to do that for some other reason, but for pelvic floor, you don't want to do that because I want you, you can see how that's pushing her lower back into the floor. So that is taking her pelvis out of neutral position. So if you're working um, to open the pelvic floor, you definitely want to work at 90 degrees, even if you have the ability to go past that. Now, you may be working with somebody who's very tight in their hamstring and maybe they can only get their leg to here. And then what's, what's happening there is that's usually pulling the back up into too much arch. So if you're working with somebody who has really tight hamstrings, I'm going to say bend the knee just to show this. Uh, for this particular exercise, I prefer to have the femur bone at 90 and have the knee bent than the leg straight and out here. Okay? So Emily has the ability to be at 90 degrees with the leg straight. So go ahead and straighten. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, we just looked at the pose Dandasana, and you might remember that I asked Emily to have the, the belt buckle on this side. And if you can look at her foot, don't change it. So if you look at her foot, and this is, uh, happens to everybody, it's not just her, is that the outside edge of her foot is closer to the ceiling than the inside edge of her foot, right? So when I was asking her to pull the outside of the belt on Dandasana, I'm going to ask her in this pose with her right hand to pull more on the outside edge of the foot, so that her foot starts to get to more of a Tadasana position. Okay, so she's pulling more with the outside hand, not as much with the inside hand, which is helping her to reach up more through the inner leg, and yes, okay. So femur bones at 90 degrees, so that she's not um, pushing the low back into the floor depending on the build and the spine of the person you're working with. The, the lumbar spine, the lower spine, might be touching the floor, but it shouldn't be pushing into the floor. Now remember in Dandasana, can you see that right now Emily is basically in the same shape with her right leg as she was in Dandasana. She's at 90 degrees, body to leg. So one of the things that I um, made a point about was that she needed to be on her sitting bones. So again, if she had really tight hamstrings, can you just imitate that and push her back into the floor? And yeah, yeah. So what's happening here is then, again, her tight hamstring is, is pulling her this way. It, energetically, it's pulling the hamstring that way. Okay, and now re-straighten. So I'm going to introduce this idea. Um, and I'm going to show this. 
on Emily. So if you ever have any old yoga mats and you don't know what to do with them, you can cut them, cut them up to be like, um, I call these yoga pot holders. And um, they can be convenient for when uh, you need to make adjustments because it helps you have traction. But again, the hamstring has this idea that it, <laughs> that it should only move this way towards the heel. And that's again from a, a tightness perspective. So what I want Emily to experience is that her hamstring can actually go towards the sitting bone. Now, what that does is it sets her femur bone a little bit deeper into the back of the hip socket. You may have noticed that her breath deepened when I did that. But it also helped to bring her pelvis more in a neutral position. Does that feel better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now she's not gonna be able to do it to the amount that I'm doing it, but she can get a sense of what that feels like and she can actually start to work that way. So I'm gonna slowly release and then you're gonna try to maintain that. Good. Now, if this is new to you, if you've never done this adjustment, um, one of the things you wanna make sure you're not doing, I'm gonna show the wrong thing, is you go to grab the hamstring and then you push her leg forward. Again, so we don't want the femur. The femur is already usually too far forward in most people's bodies. So I'm trying to just isolate the muscle and to draw that down without pressure going this way. Okay? All right, and then let's see how you do with that on the other side. Okay, so um, you may notice as soon as you switch sides, uh, you may notice if you're doing this along with the video that, oh, this side's tighter or looser, or you'll see it in your student. Um, it looks to me like this is your tighter mm -hmm. hamstring because it's harder, you can see it's harder for her to get towards a 90 degree angle. So now she's I got the left leg up, so that means her left hand's gonna pull a little bit more to get the little toe edge of the foot coming down. Remember, energetically, she's trying to reach up through the inner leg. She's watching her pelvis, her breath. I'm gonna give her that adjustment, especially because this is, is her more difficult side. And again, you can see that her breath deepened as a result of that. So, that's showing, again, like if the pelvis is um, a little bit out of neutral, your breath doesn't flow as well. She's able to ground her thigh bone better. She's able to maintain that neutral position in her pelvis. So what you want to feel on the back of your body is that your weight is a little more towards your sacrum. I would say like the middle of the sacrum rather than on the lumbar spine. Okay, we haven't talked about the bottom leg at all, but don't forget the bottom leg. So the bottom leg should be working. Um, she's, again, trying to reach more through the inner, in, inner leg on the bottom leg, drawing back on that little toe side, just like she was doing with the top leg. Um, you can see this femur bone is pretty far from the ground. Uh, what tends to happen is this femur lifts and it tends to roll out. And so an adjustment I could make on her is to turn it in a little bit and put some weight there. That could be one adjustment. Um, also, uh, earlier we had um, the sandbags. So you could take a sandbag or just like a little bit of weight to help remind her to try to keep this thigh bone grounded. Okay, I wanna just show an option for that same pose. Occasionally, um, I might work with somebody who has arthritis in their hands and holding the belt can be challenging. Um, so let me just show you, I've made a loop with the belt. Again, I'm gonna hand this to Emily so that the buckle is going to be easy for her to adjust. And she's gonna place this over her body. Arms come through and then She's gonna take her right leg up, so same pose. She can go ahead and extend this leg. Okay, and then again, if she wants this a little bit tighter, she can bend a little bit 
snug it down, and then and then re-straighten. I don't know if this is that the right tension. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and the other thing is, usually people want to come out of this because their hands are hurting from holding the strap so long. So this could also be another option if you wanted to hold the pose longer. The one thing we need to be careful of here is because of where the belt is, she is popping her ribs up, which is okay. It's a result of the strap. So what I want to do to counterbalance that is, again, give her a little more support under his, is that better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you were working with somebody with really tight hamstrings, what will happen is the belt will actually start to get pulled uh, lower on the rib cage, and then it will be here and really pulling up on the ribs. So if you're working with um, that kind of person, go ahead and bend your legs again, and can you move this under your butt? So if you're working with somebody with tighter legs but that can't hold the belt, there you go. You can put it around the pelvis. The advantage of having it up here is it helps to open the chest. The downside is it can pop the ribs. There we go. And so, um, yeah, so these are just options for people who, um, for any reason, can't hold the belt or, it, you know, if you want them to stay in the pose three minutes and that's just too much for their hands, this can be an option. Okay, now if you have um, two straps, um, I want to show you uh, the same pose again, a uh, different version. So um, to get into this, if you've never done this before, the first time you do it can be a little daunting. But once you get used to it, um, you'll be like, why have I never done this before? So I'm going to ask Emily to straighten her left leg along the ground and then to draw the right leg into the chest. So this is the position you want to put the belt on. If you put the belt on in this position, what happens is she's then not able to, to lift the leg up. That's the biggest mistake I see people make. So we have a loop strap. She, she hugs her leg in. I'm going to start with this big. And so we're putting it around her right hip crease and her left foot. And then again, the tail of the belt is somewhere where she can adjust it. So this is the measurement. Her knee is in, and that's where I want her to tighten the belt. So she pulls it towards her. Make sure the buckle isn't going to end up on the flesh of the body. And you want this pretty snug because um, this is called the traction strap. Is it not working? There we go. Okay. And again, if you wanted to tighten it even more, you would micro bend the bottom leg a little bit. Go ahead and bend that. She tightens just to, you know just to get that like eighth of an inch more, and then she can strongly push into this leg. And then for this, you need two straps. Um, obviously, the top strap doesn't need to be an extra long loop. It could be something again that you find around your house, an old necktie, uh, even a towel you could use. And then she takes this leg up. Okay, now I really love this version of the pose for so many reasons because she's getting so many uh, advantages from this. I think I want this a little bit lower in your hip crease. Can we just take that down? So make sure it's right up in that crease of the hip, yeah. Because what we're doing here is, again, like we were doing in Dandasana, remember I was talking about space at the top of the hip socket. This belt is insisting the, that space be there, which is going to help her breathe better. Okay, so she, um, she's checking to see that she's a neutral pelvis. She's not popping her rib cage up. Mm, she is a little bit, so I'm going to give her again extra under her head. Yeah, okay. She's pulling a little bit more on the outside strap. And then the other big advantage you get with the traction strap is the bottom leg that tends to get forgotten about has a job now. So it's pushing into the strap like it was in Dandasana. So she's actually getting a little bit of hip traction on this side of her hip. As she's pushing into this side, it's creating a little bit of space at the top of her left hip socket. The more she pushes with this leg, the more advantage her right side hip socket gets. Okay, um, And then Super micro adjustment is, again, as I was talking earlier, the outer foot tends to be easier to stretch than the inner foot. So if I ask Emily to really effort to stretch the inside edge of her leg, what that does is it pulls more on this side of the belt, 
which again is more advantageous because this is the side that tends to ride up when the, when the belt is not there. Okay, um, so you can do this version in Supta Pada Gustasana 1. You can also do it in Supta Pada Gustasana number 2, which I'm going to show you the full pose in a moment. I just want you to show you the transition. Go ahead and take that. So she takes the straps into her right hand, and then she has a little bit of support on the hip. But you can see that you can just stay in this traction belt um, for Supta 1 and 2. Okay, so go ahead and come up. Um, and then now switching sides again. If you've never done this, you're like, oh my God, it's too many belts. But let me show you a really easy way to do it. She bends her knee into her chest. She takes this one off, just rests it on her chest. So that belt is not even in the equation. She keeps this leg straight, and then she puts both legs in, so both feet, and then she just picks up the loop. And again, if she doesn't have big leg length disparity, the belt's already the right, the right she doesn't have to make any adjustments on it. Okay, and then the belt that's waiting for her on her chest, and she goes to the other side. So don't make it more complicated than it has to be, okay? If you do this once or twice, it gets really easy. The first time you do it, you, I've seen people get tied up, but <laughs> hopefully that won't happen to you. Okay, so I'm going to just go through all of the actions one more time on this side. So on this foot, she's pulling more on the outside strap. On this side, she's pulling, uh, she's trying to do it by managing how her leg and her foot is working. So she's trying to pull up on the little toe side on this foot. She's reaching more through the inside of the leg. That gives her the advantage of the outer hip being pulled down. Um, you want to make sure that your student has enough support, you or your student have enough support that, again, the back ribs are touching, the sacrum is touching. Um, and then the lumbar, the amount that the lumbar is touching the floor, it depends on the person's body shape. Um, but what we don't want to do is have the lumbar spine pushing into the floor. So again, if you were working with somebody with tight hamstrings, they might be working here with a slight bend in their leg. The most important thing is this 90 degree angle of the thigh bone. It doesn't have to be the whole leg. Okay. And then again, just so she's even, we'll just show you again. You can just stay in the traction belt for Supta Pada Gustasana number two. Okay. Um, especially if you have any hip pain, uh, discomfort, this can be a really advantageous way to, to do this pose. So I encourage you to invest in the second strap. Okay. All right. And then she comes out again, not to get too tangled up. She releases this. She can release this, and she just takes this off. Okay? Okay, I want to show you one more version of the same pose, Supta Pada Gushasana number one. So for this, you want to make sure you don't have anything under your head, and that'll make sense in a moment. So I'm going to take Emily's pillows away from her. And then you want to have a yoga brick. Um, if you don't have a yoga brick, you could use um, a copy of uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. Uh, any big books can, can work sometimes. Okay, so this is going to go under her sacrum on the lowest side. So she lifts up, and then she might need to make some micro adjustments. The, the big thing you want to be careful of is to just make sure it's not in the lumbar spine. So if you're not sure where the lumbar spine is, it ends at the top of the buttock. So just make sure that the, the, um, the brick is not above the top line of the buttock, okay? All right, so in this version of the pose, she has a strap nearby, and she's gonna draw the right leg in, and she's got a belt, and I'll let her show you because uh, now, some, she's a little more mobile. Can you show, show that again? I just want to show that some people might have a little bit of an issue here, um, that if they're bigger or less flexible, they're going to have to fling it, okay? So just know that you might have to try a couple times to get it there, okay? So you can see, again, same, everything's the same. This is all the same, the femur at 90 degrees. Um, now, the advantage of this one is if you're working with somebody who... Um, is what I call a mother tucker, meaning they are in posterior tilt all the time and they have a flat lumbar spine. This can be really helpful for them because then they're not going to push the lower back into the floor. The lower back is in its natural curve. So your spine is getting an advantage. Um, the other advantage is um, for the bottom leg. So she goes ahead and extends the bottom leg. Okay, so 
What she's getting here on the brick that she doesn't get when she's on the floor is now she's getting a stretch in her left hip flexor. So she could feel that maybe in the quadricep, uh, the front of the thigh, if that was really tight on her. If her quad's a little more open, she might feel it more in the front of the groin area, so in that hip crease area. Um, but deeper than that is the psoas muscle, that hip flexor that attaches to the lumbar spine and has some attachments to your respiratory diaphragm. And so um, a lot of us are tight in that uh, psoas muscle from sitting. Um, if you sit a lot, that muscle has no option but to be in contraction. So this, she's getting, um, what I'm hoping she's noticing is that she can breathe a little bit better on the left side. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, and that's because of this opening on her thigh. It's not as uh, pronounced when she's on the ground. So... This, I don't advise doing the other supta padas in this series, but for, for this particular one, uh, I think it's a great option. So to come out, I'm gonna ask her to bend the left leg, and then she releases the right leg down, and then she just starts over, okay? I think that's the safest way to do it, r rather than trying to balance on the brick. So this leg goes up first. She gets this in the right position. She's pulling more on the outside strap. She's feeling that she's well grounded on her middle sacrum. And then she extends this leg out. And this is her tighter side. <laughs> okay, so you can see um, that she's having a harder time on this side straightening her leg, which tells me that this hip flexor is tighter. And this, if you remember her in the breathing practice, that was the harder side for her to breathe into. So it's just confirming everything that um, we found earlier. So um, I think that one of the reasons her breath isn't as deep on her right side is this tightness here. So what I would be advising Emily to do in her home practice is to stay on this side longer. That's one option. Or as I mentioned uh, earlier, you could she could start on this side do her, her more open side and then come back and do her harder side again so that she's little by little uh, increasing the openness on this right hip flexor. Now, occasionally you might be working with somebody who is tighter or um, larger, and so for them to get this leg down, they, they can't. Like, it's straight and it's floating here, and that's actually not so good for them. So you definitely want, if you're working with somebody like that, you definitely want to have another brick um, or, you know, anything. You could have a second brick under the foot. You could even take a blanket under here. Um, you don't want the leg floating because um, what the tendency is then, what, what the person will do is bend the knee, and when the, bend, when the knee bends, then the stretch here goes away. So, you know, I want to encourage her to reach through the back of the leg, to flex the foot strongly, to draw the toes back, again, to draw the little toe side back, um, and that's, that's a fair amount of work for her. Okay, and remember coming out, she bends this leg first, and then this leg down. And then to come out of this, she lifts up. And when she lifts up, she's pulling the brick, but I want her to uh, engage her buttocks. Um, and that just keeps the lower back safe. And she has her buttocks engaged till she's all the way down. And then she can totally relax. <laughs> 